Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're very, very welcome to this webinar uh, this afternoon on reflections from the COP to the Conference of Parties, which is happening in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, uh, since the 30th of November, and it'll conclude on the 12th of December. I'm uh, Fergal McNamara, and I'm going to uh, chair this session this afternoon. And I'm really delighted to uh, welcome four on the ground in Dubai distinguished experts uh, who I will introduce uh, one by one and, and in turn in a few moments. Uh, they will give us the state of play on the discussions and the negotiations uh, that are happening on the ground uh, in the United Arab Emirates. And you also can join in this discussion by please putting your questions or observations into the Q&A function on the Zoom as they occur to you, please don't wait till the end, uh, put them in as, as, as soon as they occur to you. And uh, for those of you using X or Twitter, uh, please use the hashtag at IIEA. Uh, this whole session will be uh, on the record, uh, the remarks of the panelists plus the Q&A afterwards. And uh, first up, I'm really delighted to welcome to the webinar uh, Kevin O'Sullivan. And Kevin is the uh, Environment and Science Editor in the Irish Times and has a special interest in uh, climate change and environmental protection matters. Uh, Kevin, you're very welcome to our uh, webinar. And maybe I could start with you and, and ask you, uh, you're sort of almost a week into the COP at this point. Uh, I think tomorrow or Thursday is a rest day. Um, how, how are things, how, how have things been going? They, they seem to get off to a flying start with the uh, loss and damage fund. And then we've had some big pessimism creep in about the phase out of fossil fuels. Um, what's your take on it? How's it, how's it going out there uh, from where you're sitting? Thank you. Thanks, Virgil. Delighted to be with you. Um, I, 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 overall, I have, I have a very positive outlook. Actually, maybe I'm, I'm being naive, and I've been disappointed at previous cops uh, when big measures looked on the cards and then were diluted out. Uh, sometimes in the last seconds of a cop, as happened in Glasgow. But firstly, we got off to a very good start. Um, the, the structure of a loss and damage fund to help developing countries uh, and particularly climate vulnerable countries. Um, was agreed in advance after some difficult technical discussions. And then um, it was agreed by the parties very quickly in the first hours of COP28 here in Dubai. And that was a really good trust builder be between parties. And uh, uh, immediately people started giving very significant sums of money to the loss and damage fund. And I think it's probably approaching $1 billion now. But of course, as you and your audience knows, it, it, we will need many billions of dollars, uh, particularly channeled through that route. But anyway, it was a good omen. And um, over the weekend, then, there was a plethora of announcements on all sorts of cooperation projects for the developing world, big participation by, by business and industry, lots of cooperation between the Global North and the Global South. Um, and then uh, that, that sort of kept the mood still. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, since then, it, it became clear that fossil fuel phase out versus fossil fuel phase down was going to be the big issue, uh, and as it has been in recent COPs. But uh, the, the the mood was kind of um, became a little bit tense when the, the controversy over the COP president, uh, Sultan al Jaber. Uh, criticizing Mary Robinson and being quite testy in his response to her questions about the science of 1.5 degrees. Um, and then a, a big avalanche returned uh, the following day. The story was in The Guardian and uh, of scientists saying, look, he's at variance with the science. And in effect, he, he kind of backtracked a little. He's, a, as you know, he's an engineer. He knows the science. And uh, he does happen to be chairman of the largest um, oil company in UAE, the state company, Adnoc. So that added a little bit of a frisson to the whole controversy. Um, but he has been saying repeatedly that, that 1.5 degrees, in other words, keeping the global temperature rise to within 1.5 degrees is his North Star. And I prefer to focus on that really, because I think that's the first time a major representative of a petro state or a state actor that's big in oil and gas saying that. In other words, it's it's in effect now acknowledging the game is over, but it's a question of how you proceed from then. Uh, so I think that's where the big prize might be. Uh, it mightn't be the outcome that many would like, but I think there will be will be progress on that. 
So the next question is, how is that going to be achieved? And it's very clear early on that this is going to be done through the global stock take. And uh, this, this is a mechanism of the Paris Agreement, which requires that all states within five years must identify their progress on decarbonization, but also on lots of other climate actions. And uh, they have to be frank about it. They have to provide the data and then they have to respond to that. And then not only that, collectively the, through the COP process, the, the whole conference of the parties uh, in, under the Paris Agreement must decide what's the best response from that. So uh, the people who want the most progressive outcomes, they're saying um, to, to stay within 1.5, you have to have uh, phase out and that this has to be the obvious conclusion of the global stock take. So that's where they're pushing for this outcome. Now, today was interesting because the parties, in effect, have done all they can on the analysis and the data, and now they've handed it all over to the COP presidency to try and knock political heads together in the, in the coming days. Um, so there's a little bit of momentum on that. Obviously, it will come down to language, and it will come down to you know, how the, the, the more reluctant parties, obviously the petro states, respond to all of this. So that's where we are as of now. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's very uh, comprehensive and um, uh, be looking forward to seeing how things play out over the coming days or week. Uh, could, could I turn to you, uh, Alexandra Dupre, please? Um, you uh, work in international climate governance and cooperation, mm -hmm. and I think you've been heavily involved in several COPs in the past. You prepared mm -hmm. the rule book for COP23 and COP24 in Paris, mm -hmm. and uh, we're a member of the Costa Rica delegation, and currently you're uh, with the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations in Paris. So thank you very much for joining us uh, at short notice, in fact. Um, and, and this question that Kevin has just raised about the phase down, the phase out of uh, fossil fuels, uh, the, the abatement, uh, the mitigation and the abatement. And before the conference, of course, we had the, the UN stock take report and the UN gap report. Uh, how are you seeing all this? And it, maybe in terms of the countries uh, re replenishing their NDCs over the coming, uh, over the rest of the COP and over the coming years. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. And um, yes, so as mentioned, um, my focus outside, just to give context, perhaps my focus outside of this 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 COP um, at Idri is really on um, several things. It's on linking climate and biodiversity together, having high ambition outcomes on that. So that's also a major issue that is being um, addressed well or not here. Um, and also then the whole question of like net zero integrity, like how do we how do we get to the 1.5, like how do we keep temperature rise at 1.5? And that's, of course, as um, Kevin just described, uh, that's why the, I mean, the IPCC is very clear that to get to keep that temperature, we need to phase out fossil fuels or, I mean, for phase out meaning pretty much reducing to very minimal amounts of fossil fuels. Um, and so, yes, I guess, I think one of the things that I guess is uh, something that can be celebrated at the moment um, in terms of the GST text, so the global stock take negotiation text that is at the moment, is that it really is the first time that um, after Glasgow in COP26 and last year, um, that, that we have very ambitious language as an option in the text. So that explicitly calls for the phase out of all fossil fuels. Um, and one of the options is just, uh, I think it's like just and just and rapid decline of, or sorry, I don't, I don't have the text under my eyes, but really calling out for phasing out all fossil fuels. It, that's the first time that this appears in the text. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, however, there are as, Right now, as uh, Kevin mentioned, we are at the stage where the sort of more technical negotiators that are already, so the GST is already in a sort of more political phase for the past six months, that it took really all the sort of, all the discussions on the technical findings um, that have been put together over the past two years. The GST has been going on for two years and 
so now since since June, there have been discussions on how do we land that in a political package um, at COP28. And so as Kevin was describing, we're at the moment for that text, which actually was quite like pretty bloated. It's like 24 pages with over a hundred articles. Uh, so across all the issues that the GSC covers, which is all the issues like mitigation, adaptation, finance, loss and damage, way forward, how do we cooperate going forward? How does this address the NDCs? All that is over a hundred like over a hundred small articles, over 25 pages, and this is being now given to the ministerial level. And so work will still continue to be done on that at the technical level, but normally at this point in time, the 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 whole point in the COPs is for the more technical negotiations to really at the end of the first week um, bring a very clean text to the ministers so that they have limited um, options to sort of do more political um, compromise on. And so the text we see now is not at that stage. So that is one area of concern in a sense. And in particular, uh, around that in particular, there's a concern around the process because this is a party driven process, as you all know, the, it's really the parties that need to decide collectively, but we have examples in the past, such as in Copenhagen, when um, countries, a couple of powerful countries try to make a deal behind closed doors. So there is, I have been hearing um, senior people talking about this risk at the moment of, um, and in particular, of course, this would be, this is very related to the fossil fuel phase out piece because it, it, if if the countries that are in the room, which might not even include the EU, so that's like US and China, UAE, and others perhaps, um, what kind of language are we getting out of that group? Um, so that's one risk. And so it's really important to have like transparency um, and to keep the process really party driven. And then I guess on the other hand of the fossil fuel phase out uh, issue, is like the coalition of like, well, at the moment it's not fully formed, but there are a number of um, ambitious uh, country groups that have been calling for very strong texts. So that's of course, AOSIS, which is the Alliance of um, Islands. And so they have been calling for that a lot. Um, ILAC, which is a Alliance of Progressive Countries in Latin America. Also, for instance, Colombia that just um, joined the non-proliferation, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and the EU, which in its council conclusions does call for a phase out of, like a full phase out in the energy sector and some clear safeguards around um, say CCS, the whole abatement issue for um, especially the sort of industry sector. So at the moment, those um, countries are still holding the line uh, in the negotiations, in the GST negotiations saying, uh, we need the options that we can work with is phase out of all fossil fuels full stop. But um, of course, they need to be working more together at the moment and, and building a strong coalition because otherwise it's, there is this risk that, um, yeah, that the decisions will be made without them and that the compromise text between US, China, UAE, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, would not be that ambitious. Um, so I would say just that, and and maybe I'll like leave it at that at the moment, um, but just maybe just the final point that I could make regarding uh, some important issue also here is, well, maybe just two final points. Uh, on the GST, of course, uh, to get this like ambitious package on a fossil fuel phase out, um, it is of course necessary to have balance. So, and to address the sort of the issues that are really important to um, parties that, yeah, to different parties. So that is for instance, really having a clear implementation package for developing countries. So how do we transition out of fossil fuels that requires a lot of finance and there needs to be strong language around that both in the GST and in other texts. And also the whole question of adaptation, which is of course most important to developing countries and countries that are vulnerable um, to climate change. And so at the moment, adaptation has been a bit, um, I don't want to say ignored, but that's always often the dynamic. So that's happening. And then the other thing, just more generally 
inside and outside of the negotiations is this whole question of the role of nature. So this this question of nature has been put on the agenda by the COP presidency as one of their priorities. But in my perspective, a lot of the their view is very much um, um, using nature as offsets. So offsetting na fossil fuels with nature, and that is highly problematic. So there are a lot of different pledges that have occurred over the past few years, different proposals, for instance, from Brazil and others to find new ways to um, scale up the very much needed finance for nature nature protection of, of ecosystems in a way that is not using uh, that is not using carbon credits. I mean that is not using carbon credits as offsets for emissions. So there are different thoughts of how to do that. But um, at the moment, there are also very sketchy deals and concerning dynamics happening around that. For instance, the whole question that occurred before COP of um, a company called Blue Carbon based in the UAE that is buying up basically yeah. huge amounts of land well, in Africa. And African countries are sort of yeah. accepting to sell this precisely because in part, there is no political deal that brings them money to preserve their ecosystems in a way that is not linked to fossil fuels. So that's just an issue I wanted to point out because, of course, uh, COP30 in two years, the next big moment is held in Brazil. And so this whole question of na uh, like ecosystems, nature, how do we bring that together will be very important going up to that. And also in light of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that was adopted in China. So I'll leave it at that, but happy to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. You said a lot there, uh, Alexandra de Prey. Thank you very much for that. Um, and we will come back to some of the points that you uh, that you raised there. Can I next move to you, uh, Dr. Rune Murray? You're working in uh, international um, development for more than uh, 20, 28 years, it says. Is COP28 is a coincidence there? Um, and uh, you're a director of the International Development Practice at the University of Galway. And I suppose the question on all our lips is about the loss and damage fund that just uh, the one that Kevin O'Sullivan mentioned a little bit that the conference started off with such a uh, such an interesting uh, beat uh, and originally conceived that uh, Sharm El Sheikh and our own Minister Ryan had a big role in putting that together. But the other one is the promise that uh, developed countries would make to developing countries of 100 billion in climate finance uh, by 2025. Um, can, can I ask you how things are going with either or both of those and what your take is on them? Thank you. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, loud and clear. Yep, Thank you very great. much. Great. Um, yeah, no, so I've been, this is only my third cop, it's not my 28th. So, um, yeah, so I've been following quite a bit the climate mobility groups uh, who talk about internal displacement, and that's quite interesting because um, placement, but not all of them are from climate, but it's increasing in terms of climate. You know, some of them are from um, due, due to conflict and the the connection between conflict and climate is growing, you know, where you can kind of make that connection where there's less resources, there's more tendency for conflict. <clears throat> but what's interesting about it is that most of the internal displacement is in just 10 countries. Um, yeah, you can probably kind of guess them, you know, but are coming coming from, from very few countries as well. And patterns of displacement are interesting as well. You know, some of, in Africa, some of them are going south to um, South Africa. This is people who move after they've been displaced, who don't stay um, in, their, in their own country where migrants or they move to Libya, or some of them go towards Yemen and towards where we are now, the Gulf, which is, is kind of a very attractive place for, for migrants to go. But not all of them are coming from, um, from conflict-related um, regions, um, are talking a lot about having to move because internally displaced because of flooding and drought. And in some countries, it's both flooding and drought. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. We, all, we can also think of the US where... American retirees move to Florida because they want because of climate because they want more time in the sun. So people move anyhow because of because of the weather. But in terms of loss and damage, then um, and I think Kevin uh, summarized it really well there. Uh, the Climate Mobility Group are trying to ensure that displaced internally displaced people are able to get access to some funds um, going forward in loss and damage. But people were generally happy with the outcome of loss and damage and the pledge of the funds, including from Ireland. And from 
some of the civil society groups. Uh, they're wondering what is next. Uh, and some, I have to say, are worried about the composition of the board and the secretariat of, loss, of the loss and damage fund at the World Bank, but that hasn't been decided yet. Um, and we did in, we have another master's in Galway on climate change and agriculture and food security. And we did have uh, someone from Irish Aid talk to the class in advance of COP. And we also had um, an advocate talk, you know, around the same time. So we were aware of the kind of differences or the issues in advance. Um, so some of the, the things that they're coming up with that the funds should, there should be many streams to the funds and they, and it hasn't been decided yet. This is to be decided by in the next eight months um, through the board of the World Bank. But the funds should have a rapid response mechanism. Um, some of the, the funds should be kind of nationally decided or nationally owned. And some people are saying there should be a sub-national focus. But then some people are worried that the funds will get stuck at the national level. Um, and they're, you know, they want a human rights based focus in the in the operationalization of the funds and then that there's space for displaced people and people who are on the move internally. And that's quite important. Um, and if they're moving because of conflict linked with environment and climate, you know, they may not be able to access it through government channels, if you know what I mean. Um, so and they're worried about the eligibility criteria to the fund, but it seems positive and I hear a lot about they've learned from the challenges of getting distribution of the green climate fund and the adaptation fund and how long that took to um, to register as a, an entity to get funds. Uh, so going forward, I think they do want some funds for for displaced people and people who are on the move and people who are vulnerable and don't have a voice. And kind of my role here in COP, I'm, I'm working on social protection and um, uh, people on the move, social protection or policies, you know, like we have in Ireland, like when we when we had a shock like COVID, our government was able to um, upscale or um, vertically in, um, increase the funds for social protection. So I, we're doing an event with um, UNICEF, World Bank and or I'm doing an event with them and uh, the Germans and the Red Cross and some ministers. And it's kind of on how some of the loss and damage funds can be channeled through social protection mechanisms. And the reason for that would be that they it, they're not projectized, yeah. So it, it 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 it's hopefully it'll reach a lot of people, um, at the one time, or a lot of people, you know, in the one area, one geographical area, and kind of issues around how if if these systems, if there's an infrastructure in place for getting that those funds out through social protection systems, it's one of the channels that it might be able to get out to rural areas or to people who are displaced. And it can help also social protection also has a role in prevention um, and helping people before they're displaced so they don't have to sell their assets, you know, if they get some small cash. But the problem with social protection is that it's not everywhere and it's I mean, it's growing in importance, but it's not, um, um, not all countries have that system, particularly fragile um, countries. So that's really what I'm hearing about uh, loss and damage and the discussions going forward in terms of trying to keep displaced people also on in the going forward part of the global stock take. Um, and uh, another area is the Just Transitions path, Pathway Program. I don't know if you, you if, if I, I can talk about that later if you want, but that's another kind of work program that was discussed today that I attended. But I'll go back to you for now and give someone else a chance. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank, look, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murray. Thank you for, for, for that. Sounds like a lot of uh, activity ahead, a lot of uh, head of steam building around lots of damage fund. And uh, good luck with the rest of uh, the discussions around that. Uh, can I ask the participants, uh, remind the participants uh, to please put any questions or observations into the Q&A function in the Zoom here. And anybody um, on Twitter or X, the handle is asked by IEA. And uh, I'm turning now to you, uh, Alex, Alex White, uh, Director General here of the Institute, the uh, International Institute of uh, International and, uh, European Affairs, uh, Senior Counsel at the Irish Bar, uh, former uh, Government Minister in TD, um, and uh, uh, Councillor and, and Broadcaster. Alex, it's great to ha have you uh, on the line, uh, as always. 
Um, and I, I'd like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the ambience there, the COP. There are 70,000 people. There's a blue zone and a green zone, and there's uh, people from all over the world have arrived, and everybody's furiously negotiating in parallel tracks at different uh, topics and so on. Could you give us a, a flavour of all of that, please? Well, you've actually described it very well there, Fergal. Um, if, if somebody, uh, if you arrived into this area, without any sense of what you were going to do. In other words, if somebody just set you loose here, it'd be very hard, it's, it's very, very hard to uh, uh, navigate or to choose things. You can navigate because they give you a great, you know, there are apps and there's various different uh, guidance, but you, you'd want to have a purpose here because it's almost overwhelming in terms of the number of things that are happening. Obviously the official negotiations are going on, but there's so much else uh, going on. People advancing their own agendas, different meetings, NGOs, obviously, faith groups, um, commercial interests, which we've heard a lot about, not just in the oil sector, but obviously in the oil sector is a big factor that people have identified. But it's a huge area. It's a massive, you can try, it's hard for me even to describe it, my limited powers of description. It's, it's, it's some distance outside the center of Dubai. So most people who are staying in the, in the city, as I am, come out by metro, an unbelievably efficient clean, you know, 21st century public transport system that whisks you out there, stops along along the way, but it gets you out here. Um, it, but it, I, I, my first COP, this is my third one as well. I represented um, Ireland at the, at, Le at the Peru COP in, and then again, I was in Paris, but at the one in 2014 in, in Lima, I mean, uh, no harm to the poor Peruvians, but I mean, it was just, it, it ground to a halt at different stages because people couldn't move around the city of Lima. I remember myself being stuck in traffic, trying to get back to speak at the conference. You know, you were, you were trying to get around. It was a, whole, a world of a difference to what we're, we're seeing here today, just in terms of sense of organization. I mean, there's no feeling of congestion. I don't know if other people would agree with me. I mean, there's no, everything moves. You know, you go into a really orderly queue, you get in and out. I mean, it's, 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 it's remarkable actually how well organized it is. And in fact, arguably, somebody said to me earlier, ran into Philip Lee earlier, solicitor, well-known solicitor of Dublin, he was saying, you know, actually, arguably, it's kind of nearly too big in the sense that, like, you know, it, it doesn't need to have this level of space and, uh, and, and, I mean, it's great to have it, but you just have this sense of an unbelievable, an unbelievably well-organized uh, uh, um, uh, um, place. Now, in terms of negotiations and what's happening, I'm, I'm in... Um, B1 here, it's this large building where a lot of the negotiations are going on, parallel negotiations on different things. Yeah, you, you can, I see Owen Lewis had a question there, can you go in and out of the meetings? Actually, you can. You know, there's, okay, there's a blue zone and a green zone. We're in the blue zone, so you have to have a special pass for the blue zone. Um, but there's a lot of people in the blue zone. Um, and you can, I wandered into Article 6 negotiations earlier, and there's, you know, all of the parties set out around the room, they've got the text up on screens, they're actually working on the text. Now, I, I mean, Alexander is right. You know, you don't, they, they, it, it, they have to prepare a clean text for the final minister, you know, for the, the, the ministerial sessions for that's required. But you will see the text on the board. You'll see people debating the meaning of words, the meaning of phrases, how things should be worded, how things should be landed in terms of text. You can actually see the negotiations and you can observe the negotiations happening. Not, as I said, the inner sanctum of the ministerial ones, but you can see an awful lot. So there is an openness in that sense. And it is, you know, it's 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 it is quite interesting to to wander in and out of those meetings to get a sense of of, of what's happening. So that's my, my my overall sense that yes, highly organised, um, you know, very secure, not much protest. I did come in earlier. There was a um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a, uh, it certainly wasn't a conflictual type protest, but there were people um, uh, making a point on biodiversity and they were chanting. And it was kind of great to hear because there are people, you know, there's a pulse and people are just not going along with everything and necessarily accepting everything they're being told. But there's no there's no feeling of mass of mass protests or demonstrations. But, I'm, but there are a lot of really active and really strong NGOs here and you can see them and meet them. Thank you very much, Alex. You so painted, painted a very live picture for us there of, of, of the on the ground situation. Um, and, and thank you all for the uh, answers to the, to the questions I put there. Could, could I maybe circle around a little bit and go back again to 
Alexandra the, the prayer, please. And just to pick up on this point about the uh, negotiations and the text, I mean, everything has to be agreed unanimously. So in other COPs in Glasgow, for example, we saw political declarations coming outside agreements, uh, net, net, uh, net zero vehicles, for example, methane pledges, things like that, uh, political declarations. Uh, at Sharm el Sheikh, we saw some criticism of the conclusion of the final text, and then there was a, a review by the UN uh, FCC Secretariat for process changes this year. So, um, can, can I come back to you on that, and and, and maybe Kevin, if you wanted to come in on it too, uh, what what the product of the COP will be in terms of text, in terms of declarations, and in terms of uh, everybody having a collective buy-in to whatever that outcome is. Uh, maybe first Alexandra de Pre, and then back to Kevin O'Sullivan. Thank you. Yes. So thank you. I think. Um, what you just said, and then also what Alex mentioned, um, really reminded me sort of a broader general point. Uh, so the basically at the moment of the Paris Agreement, there were well all the like major negotiations to come up with the Paris Agreement, and then there were a couple of years of really negotiating all the rules of the Paris Agreement. So those were really actual strong, uh, meaningful negotiations, and so after that. There has been uh, over the past few years, like in the think tank community and others, practitioners working on in this process, uh, the whole question of like what is sort of a the cop the UNFCCC going through an existential like um, teenager crisis in a sense of growing up. Like after we've negotiated this agreement, we now all know that to uh, reach the I mean to to reach the the goals of the Paris Agreement and the Convention, there's a need for implementation on the ground, and so that's why over the past few years, the COPs have sort of evolved from. Of course, the negotiations remain central, but that's also where you have seen all these the broader sort of action agenda, everything that's happening. So I guess now we could call them like the non-negotiated outcomes, all the pledges, the declarations. And that was very visible, as you said, at COP26. And there has, has also been a bit of a criticism of, of in the past few years, but I think also this year of this sort of bloating up of pledges. And in fact, today, someone was telling me that there's new research coming out that the more uh, you pledge, like the more countries pledge, there's actually the less they do. There is research showing that. So I think that is a major concern. And over the past few years, and I think it's very pertinent to this COP, the whole question of what is the legitimacy of this process? I mean, if we cannot deliver, um, it, it poses questions. There's always been questions of like, how does this process actually deliver as we see that the gaps between where we need to be in where we are continue to grow. I think all this is relevant because um, as I said before, it's it's really a historic moment uh, that we're in at the COP after 28 COPs to really have text in textual proposals in 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 the draft decisions that are being negotiated, concrete proposals of phasing out fossil fuels, which is the clear central cause behind climate change. So I think I mean, one can decry that it's taken 28 years, and I would be the first one to do that. But at the same time, I think we are at this historic moment, and it is. I I am hearing very clearly that if we do not get that, uh, I mean, this is. It has been hyped up as the expectation. It is essential that um that come out as the outcome. I think, um, yeah, there is question of if especially given that the, the global stock take as the sort of ambition mechanism of the Paris Agreement is meant to inform the next round of nationally determined contributions that each country makes. So sending the signal of phasing out fossil fuels this year is essential so that countries can also be pressured into putting that in their next plans. And so I did a long trade on that, and now I forgot your first initial, initial question. So I will I'll stop there, um, but happy to come back. And apologies if, yeah, got sidetracked on that line. Um, Thanks. That, that, yeah, I, I, I think that's a really good summation of, of, of the whole different dynamic. Uh, I would add to that that this year is different in many, in many different ways, which is, makes it interesting. Uh, and firstly, um, I think there's more substantial 
things on the table and even now that gives it a, a, a strong potential to have a good cop outcome and, and possibly even the best outcome since since Paris itself. Um, and I think there's a, a helpful, ironically, there's a very helpful element in that, and that is the chairmanship of the president, current president of COP, because I think he has razor-like focus, and it's well worth listening to his opening address. He set out very clearly, bang, 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 what he wants, you know, what, what way he wants parties to, uh, to come to the negotiations in terms of coming to an understanding. There was a great clarity about it. Now, you might question his motivation in terms of, you know, what he ultimately wants himself in terms of fossil fuel use. But I still think that dynamic is really strong. Um, and even the fact that we are discussing tech so early in the process, like this is almost a week to go, um, is very, very helpful. I think they they will keep saying that we're going to end on time and push that that to uh, to all the parties if they have to negotiate throughout the night for the five nights, that, that will happen. Um, so uh, the other thing that's really clear here is that um, it, the, is that the global stock take will be the mechanism for that to happen. Like so, that's where all the bets are at the moment. Even though everything will be tied in, as Alexandra has, has flagged, underneath that, um, so that's space to watch in terms of progress or not. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, uh, Alex, if I could just come back to you about uh, the negotiation, the negotiation coalitions, because it does come down to the inner circle of senior governmental officials, some particularly key players in that at the end of the day, after the nights, the five nights that Kevin just spoke about. And uh, there's a question uh, in, in the chat about uh, the development of the um, of the coalition, it's like we have the G77, we have the BRIC countries, we have the EU, we have the different blocks, the um, ASEAN block and so on. Uh, could, could you speak a little bit about how those dynamics work and how the how, how the countries, how the coalitions uh, develop so that we know we have, when we actually have a meeting of minds and an agreement? Yeah, um, I, I suppose um, you're right that, you know, there are different uh, groups come together for the purposes of negotiation or they find themselves thrust together if they've got the same agenda or the same they want the same outcome on a particular issue. So they make alliances. Um, and as we see in any kind of negotiations, you know, you're sometimes you're you, you find yourself in alliances with countries or with interests that you didn't necessarily foresee that would that that would occur but because you've got a particular priority you're pushing for that priority you'll take help and support from wherever you get it and it is like negotiation is a, as everybody on this call will know only too well very complex um unpredictable sometimes a uh, process and um i mean i think alexander described it really really well but, but uh, you know that you want to try to clear you want to try to do as much of the negotiation as we're out of the room uh, before you get there it's, again like any negotiations at home people be familiar with you know pay negotiations or any negotiations to form governments um which i was involved in myself at one point you know where you you want to get as much of the i hate these phrases heavy lifting but you know get as much of the the stuff that can be agreed done and dusted and that can sometimes take days and days and weeks and then it just comes to the final call something has to be a net a net call has to be made on something and um, a minister may decide or a group of ministers may decide, well, look, we're not 100% happy uh, with, with this particular likely outcome, but we've got most of what we wanted. We've got this, you know, tick the box, we've got that. We've got most of the other. Look, I think we're moving towards an agreement. And that's the way you've seen with previous COPs where right up to the last minute, people have held out on particular issues, but then Perhaps, I mean, and again, Kevin and the others will maybe have a view on this, perhaps because they've got enough to, to go home with, as it were, or enough to make progress with, as they would see it, that they're prepared then to um, maybe throw in the towel on a particular issue that they were holding out on. And I mean, in, from Ireland's point of view, I think it's important to, to remember, and Eamon Ryan was making this point uh, when, it, when it came up that I think there was a discussion about him having to go, maybe having to go home to Dublin, but he didn't in the end. But he was just making the point that, you know, he's part of a team of EU uh, uh, ministers. And that's, as I recall it from Lima and Paris, that is the way that the EU, of course, will negotiate as a bloc, as a group. And your, your influence on that as an Irish minister is within the EU room. 
Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of the stuff is trashed out in there. And uh, priorities of individual countries within the, the of individual member states will have to be sifted through and negotiated and navigated in the EU in the EU room, if I can call it that, before then hopefully the EU has a, 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 a common position in the broader negotiations. So um, that's certainly my recollection of, of of how things of how things happen in those sort of closing stages. Alex, there's one question in the chat box from uh, Francis Jacobs is asking you to to, to predict um, to predict the, the the final final issues. I think we've we've had a chat about some of those. Some of the uh, the question of phase down, phase out of fossil fuel is the is the issue de jour, really? Is it? Well, I passed that over to to the others as to their prediction, yeah, but yeah. they're probably in a better position. But I will just say that I, I think it was one or other, you know, this point about negotiation, one other thing about words, you know, individual words can sometimes take an awful lot of work. So abatement has, has come in. So what does, so then we, what does abatement mean? You know, what is abated? What's, what's non-abated? So we think we understand what these words mean in the English language. We use them occasionally, but then what do they mean in the context of, of fossils? You know, unabated, completely unabated, partly unabated. You know, and, and these, I, I know this can sound a bit tedious to people. Oh God, are they seriously pouring over just one word? Well, yes is the answer to that because it, it, that's, that's, that's what's necessary to, to, get, to get, because there's no point in agreeing to something that there's three different views as to what it means. So if you've got, and we see that's, of course, how agreements fall apart. People made an agreement, but then they have a different view afterwards as to what they meant when they had that agreement. So you want to try to, as Alexander said, get clear clarity in an agreement and and a common view as to what the agreement means. Negotiate away the squares, as they say. Kevin? If I come in there, yes, just to say that um, if any form of phase out appears in the text, that would be truly remarkable. Mm -hmm. And as Al Gore says, it would be a, a really beneficial thing for humanity across the planet. So that's the high point. But the risk is that from every hour on, they will be chipping away at the impact of that. And uh, that's what I fear. And I've been duped before in the sense that I thought we were getting good outcomes, particularly in Glasgow. And uh, it was just appalling the way it was excise from the text uh, and much to dismay about a great many people so uh, that that's that's the big risk at this point um, but if I was to weigh it up I think there will be some strong reference to fossil fuels in the final decision I think the, the GST the global stock take will be a good uh, momentum driver because it's They've put so much stock, to use that word, in into this. It, it's it's two years of really hard work with every country participating, and then for people to be pulling out uh, would be very bad for at old series level, and particularly for their reputation as well. So I, I still think the, the the global stock tech will deliver a result. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Dr. Murray, could I come back to you here? This this question of uh, phasing out and phasing down of fossil fuels, abatement uh, is abatement an excuse, or do you need to do you need to actually uh, phase out the fossil fuels? I think you offered a little bit earlier to have a, a short uh, update for us on the uh, just transition, the halfway partnerships. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I I attended. Um... The, the debate on the work program on just transition today, um, which had both formal and informal sessions. It had been a suspended meeting and they had agreed on the first part of the text. Just transition is that, um, you know, the concept is that uh, I'm thinking in Ireland, you know, people who worked in, in turf and that they would have some sort of skills training or uh, chances to do something else. That's kind of a very, very cursory summary. But yeah, and it goes back to your question about the groupings. Um, they, they had agreed the text, but the scope of the work program on just transitions was a very long list and had everything in there, um, you know, that it covers human rights, it covers gender, it covers um, um, funding mechanisms, adaptation. So they were, uh, that, that was where the debate was, where um, there was a number of options put forward um, on, on what should be included in that list or whether that list should be consolidated or whether the list should be just, you know, one line or whatever. And text really matters. Um, and everybody is trying to make sure that something that they are um, really want to maybe 
ensure funding comes to because with text comes funding i think you know that if it's mentioned in the text it means that you can have programs afterwards so people are really trying to push that their favored issue that they're at the cop to um to work on and governments want to keep certain things in the text so that's 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 why the words matter so much and um, whether it's in there or not and there was a lot of internal concessions the group the g77 and china seemed to agree um south africa was part of the g77 um and i think about five options came were put forward and in the end a decision wasn't made uh, and it, they were told to, they were kind of going to be sent to, sent to the, the chair was going to send them to um, the secretaries or the, the president, and then they'd work on kind of a, some sort of compromise text that would have to be negotiated again. So uh, really text does matter um, for for those reasons and what's in and what's not in um, in the text is, is, you know, whether indigenous populations are included, whether Displacements included, you know, all these sort of things do do matter. Um, but then the issue is that you just can't put everything in <laughs> to everything because it becomes a little bit meaningless. Um, so, and you know, institutional management of the scope becomes more difficult. So, yeah, that was that was quite interesting um, today. And um, it, it, sorry, the just transition comes out of a decision from Sharm El Sheikh, um, and it's kind of been. Uh, conceptualized, I suppose, by the International Labour Organization, so that workers and employers organization and the government all have um, a stake in, in how this concept or this program, work program moves ahead. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murray. So uh, look, I'm looking at the time and I wanted to just come back to Alexandra Dupre for one uh, remark on the uh, abatement question, if, if, if you wouldn't mind. I notice it's getting dark where you are too, uh, Mr. Prey. But um, uh, and at the end of that, I was just going to do one more round uh, to ask each of you uh, what, what, what you're doing for the next two or three days, uh, what the priorities are and uh, what you see happening over the next uh, number of days. And then maybe we'll hear from you again when the whole COP is over. So if I could do it in that order, please, Alexandra Dupre on abatement and the next few days for you. And then Alex, Kevin, and ending with you, Dr. Murray. Thank you. Sorry, is, is it uh, the next few days for me or for the COP in general? Next few, day, next few days for you. If you have okay. uh, something to tell us about the abatement first and then yes. uh, what, what your next few days look like. Fantastic. Um, Yes. Well, first, thanks so much. This is a really interesting discussion. For instance, I don't follow at all the, the just transition and loss and damage. So it's interesting to get updates as well from others. Um, so I would say yes. On this question of, of abatement, as um, Kevin or Alex, I can't remember at this point, were saying earlier, the words really, really matter. And there is this concern, major concern, that um, I mean, even even between phase down and phase out, like phase down, just uh, I have experts that have just told me this morning for them, phase out means it's it's synonymous of peaking. So it can just mean uh, reducing fossil fuels by 1%. So phase down is really problematic as a language, especially if we put that for the long term. Um, and so then phase out, um, there's been a lot of debate around this, but in in the views of these experts I, I spoke about it it really means like reducing really to like minimal less than 10 percent of or even less and so that's when also for this question of abated unabated comes in because basically if you add the unabated um i mean they're, they're, at the moment the ipcc does not have a uh, agreed upon definition of what exactly abatement means so if that word of abatement so if we if we get in the text for instance a phase out of unabated fossil fuels and there is no definition in the le in the this cop decision on what an abated fossil fuel means then that leaves the door open to major loopholes of i mean it, it really is doesn't mean anything so that is really an outcome that um, a lot of the uh, ambitious countries want to need to avoid and I think are working very hard to avoid and I mean they were saying it's it's a big problem because this is a legal text like the Paris Agreement is a legal text um, and so the issue is that if out of here um, fossil fuel companies 
use this language to basically not change, then that is a real problem. So that's maybe on that issue. So I, I would say that, and then maybe to uh, go to what I'm doing these next few days. So I've been working on precisely drafting um, proposed text regarding abatement. Like if it does land, how can we um, define it? So how can we maybe asking the IPCC to define it? But that brings up a lot of different problems and, and dangers because who, what kind of scientists would be on that panel from different countries, including Saudi Arabia, et cetera. So we might not get an ambitious definition out of that, but uh, working on that and on the question of what safeguards do we put around that or what alternative forms of language can we uh, find that could be a compromise, um, but that does not have this term unabated. And then more generally, the other work I'm doing at the moment is really working on this question of the IPCC seventh assessment report is, is starting, that cycle is just starting off. So their, their papers will come out for the next GST. And so at the moment in January, countries are going to meet again to, um, to basically scope out what are the priorities of this next cycle. And so I've been trying here to, yeah, meet with scientists, meet with um, delegates, to really emphasize the importance of mainstream the question of biodiversity and really accounting also for this big issue of risks around carbon dioxide removal, which we didn't talk about here, but is, yeah. Anyway, so that's that's my plan for the next few days. And um, yeah, thank you. Alex, Kevin, and uh, Dr. Murray, please. Well, I'll just be brief. Um... And I, I was just listening to Alexander and Alexandra and also what others have said about this phrase, phase, phase down. I mean, it's it's actually, a, a, I think, a bit of an absurdity of, of, of afraid those two words together, phase down. I mean, Kevin is a wordsmith far more than I, but it, it's not, I've never heard down used as a word to 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 limit the notion of a phase, you know, to phase something down. Um, what does it even mean? It, it certainly is, if it's used instead of phase out, it, it clearly it clearly indicates that it's not going to get to complete removal. I mean, that's what it must mean in terms of the English language. Phase down, as distinct from phase out, must mean it's not going to be phased out, <laughs> uh, perhaps ever, um, it, that phrase. So that's a very unfortunate phrase. I just say that from the point of view, of, from, from just my own sense of it. <laughs> And uh, let's hope the stronger language that Kevin has been talking about does 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 come through. Um, can I just mention also, Fergal, uh, that we some great questions in on on the um, on the Q and A, and I'd love to be able to answer Keen Donahue's question about the Article Six negotiations. I did meet somebody just before we started this call who had been at those Article Six um, negotiations, who said that he thought there was a lot of progress made, but that. He felt, now I, hope, I don't want to misrepresent what he said to me, but I understood from what he said that they had essentially come to an end and they were pushed back to next week. That, that's that's um, Alexander's nodding. So that seems to be the case. Uh, um, and that there was some countries, perhaps including the US, were a little unhappy with where that had reached, the point that that had reached. So that's the best I can do to that very interesting and, and a clear question from 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 Keen Donaghy there. And and just uh, Francis Jacobs is Al Gore, Kamala Harris. I know John John Kerry is, is obviously here as well. So he's a very a, a very senior and experienced representative of the US. Uh, um, and Dan O'Brien had a great question there as well. Just really would be to Alexandra about this thing about big pledging, you know, this thing about big pledging countries do more backsliding. And Dan was wondering, are different regions of the world more regions of the world more guilty of that than others? And he's wondering about energy producers, are they more anyway, just some interesting questions. Uh, and and uh, uh, in my next couple of days, uh Tomorrow uh, is a down day uh, here at, at, at COP, um, and I'm going to be here until the end of the week, um, try and absorb as much of it as I can, you know, try to attend as many um, meetings and presentations as I can. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of speakers here. As I said, it's a bit overwhelming to try and find out, you know, where to be. You know, FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, that that's a real problem here at, at, at COP because you just miss the very thing that you want to see. Or somebody tells you, oh, I just was at a brilliant briefing. And, and then you, so anyway, it's to try to navigate that, uh, to try to absorb as much as possible. And then for us at the Institute, Fergal, as you know, as our co-chair of our climate and energy group, we're going to try and get into a huddle again on Friday just to review what, what's happened and see what role the IIEA can have in continuing 
this dialogue um, amongst our, our members, both policymaker members and corporate members, and to play a role, however limited that might be. But we think it's not that limited. We think we've got a lot to offer in terms of bringing together different interests in Ireland and being in a position to interact with people internationally as well on these on these questions. So that's me for the next couple of days. Busy days, Alex, uh, Kevin O'Sullivan and uh, Dr. Murray yeah. then. Well, I'll be following whole series of part of the process. And one, some will be moving faster than others. Uh, I suppose you could divide them into two in terms of the international process and then the Irish elements. And then I suppose the EU is the the interlink between the two. Uh, so um, Eamon Ryan will be here till the, the bitter end. And I would say he will be increasingly involved in, um, you know, threshing out, trashing out that detail on, on you know, what the GST progress might mean uh, and right down to the abatement issue, which which I think was fascinating. And I think it's really important that there's no get out of jail part for fossil fuel companies. Um, so then uh, the international process, the, the various iterations of the text will emerge uh, at peculiar times of the day after long nights or late evenings. Um, and uh, then there'll be a lot of re- wrestling over that. Uh, it'd be very interesting to see how the, the global stock take is um, assumed into the overall document and, and what prominence it has. So they're already discussing that. And the one really good thing is that uh, access to documentation is vastly improved since I started um, my first COP in 2017 in Bonn. So you actually see, you can get the text and you, you can see... Um, you know, you bump into negotiators who will actually fill you in on what's going on rather than hoping it might, you know, happen on someone that's a, a friendly face. And um, so you do get that flow, which is much better. Uh, and that's really good for the whole process and particularly for the political side of it. So I'll have to piece together a lot of that. But maybe to end on a positive note, I, I, I think that if there's a good outcome, history will look back and it it reflects on what Alex was saying about you know what preparatory work in advance, and I think uh, it'd be very clear that things like the Bridgetown Initiative by Mia Motley uh, in terms of global financial overhaul will have been a huge catalyst. I think there's some really meaningful um, outcomes from the G7 and G20 this year, the African Climate Summit, again help build momentum. And then uh, in more recent times, when the loss and damage structure was was agreed, that would give it even more momentum. And then the U.S.-China uh, resuming of friendship, particularly through John Kerry and his counterpart, Xi Jinping, was really helpful again. And uh, even if you follow those two around <laughs> over the next few days, it'll be quite revealing. So hopefully they'll do the business. Okay, so and I'll just go very quickly. Time. Yeah, very quickly, because I think you're finishing now. Yeah, I, I'm going to far, follow parallel process and um, pr- processes, including the global stock take. And um, it, I have to say, it's a great place for networking, getting ideas for research, um, you know, meeting old colleagues like you talked about the Convention on Biological Diversity. It, the director is, was we know him from a long time ago and he's walking around. You can meet him and have a chat. And people are, as, as Kevin said, people are very generous. Uh, you can just talk really to anyone. Irish people are good at talking. We can just, you know, start conversations. But people tell you a lot of things as you, no matter who you're sitting beside, you can just chat and say, what were you at? Well, you know, what's happening? What's your perspective on it? And I think that's really fantastic. Um, I think our Minister of Agriculture is coming l- later in the week. So we'll probably follow what what they're, what's happening there. And yeah, um, and, and also I'm moderating an event. So there's an awful lot of preparation for that. Um, and, you know, hopefully that will go well um on saturday so once that's done i'll be probably taking some photographs as well <laughs> around the place because <laughs> it's the the buildings here are quite amazing actually and it's it's kind of i'd never been to dubai before it's unbelievable um what was built in a desert uh, it's quite strange mm. to be honest but mm. yeah over back to you i think we're we're nearly on time yeah yeah, we're right on time. And t- t- thank you very much, Kevin O'Sullivan, the Irish Times, um, uh, uh, Alexandra Dupre for the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, um, uh, Will Murray of University uh, College Galway, and Alex uh, White of the IIA. Thank you all very much for your time and uh, answering all the questions and the discussion. And I close it at that. Thank you very much. Have a good day. 